Well, we've heard Minister Bill Blair speak about his expectations of police forces and enforcement of the rules around legalized cannabis, including drug-impaired driving. Let's broaden that conversation now with two members of the law enforcement community from Vancouver. We're joined by Vancouver Police Chief Adam Palmer. He's also the president of the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police. And from New Brunswick, Chief Wayne Gallen, the chief of the uh, Cannabacasis Regional Police Force outside of St. John, New Brunswick. Gentlemen, uh, thank you both for your time today. It's good to see you. Chief Palmer, let me, let me start with you. You said police in this country are ready for legalization. Uh, mm -hmm. What allows you to say that? Tell me what gives you, gives you that confidence. Sure. Well, I am confident in the abilities of police agencies across this country. We have known about legalization that it was coming since, really since the 2015 federal election. So we knew that that was going to be an election promise that would be fulfilled. And then over the last couple of years, we've been engaged in conversations and discussions. Um, CACP did have a seat at the table at various parliamentary committees and our own committees that work on these issues did have a voice. So we've known what was happening and been following it closely for the last couple of years and have had time to prepare for it. What, what do you expect, uh, you know, what are you expecting in terms of a societal change? Do you think there'll be a dramatic change in, in the way Canadians uh, go about their daily lives with legalization of cannabis? No, it's a very interesting question because I know there's been a lot of focus on the police, but I really think that it is a societal issue and Canadians just have to wrap their heads around the fact that, you know, the way they've grown up and the way things have been in our country for many, many years will change on Wednesday and cannabis will be legal and in many parts of the country, really, it will be similar to tobacco that you can walk down the street and smoke a marijuana joint and it will be no different than smoking a tobacco cigarette. So people will have to wrap their head around the changes to the uh, new laws in our country. Uh, Chief Gallant, let me turn to you in New Brunswick. Uh, what, what have you done to be ready here? Are, do you believe you are ready? And what do you think the biggest challenge is going to be? Yeah, I think we're, we're ready in New Brunswick. Uh, we've uh, invested heavily over the last uh, several years as well into increasing the number of officers that we have trained with standard field sobriety training and drug recognition expert training. Uh, we've also done a lot of familiarization with our officers on the new legislation. We work closely with our partners to have a plan in place provincially where we can support each other uh, with uh, people that are trained uh, in places that uh, may be a little re more remote or rural than, than urban areas so that the uh, police forces that police those areas can have access to the resources they need to continue to do their jobs and, and keep the roads uh, safe. So uh, overall, I think we are ready. Uh, there certainly uh, you know, is a desire to have even more people trained, so uh, we plan on doing that in the coming uh, coming months and years, uh, and we're going to continue to increase those numbers, uh, as well having the dust sort of settle on the provincial side of the legislation as well with the, with the provincial regulations uh, will be nice as well. Okay, well, well I've got the two of you. There, there's this debate in the country w within uh, police services, uh, as I understand it and as I, I hear it, where, uh, you know, there is, a, there is a new technical device to measure, measure impairment, the, uh, the, the Draeger 5000, but some forces are using it, some forces are not using it because they don't trust it, they, they want better technology. Chief Palmer, let me start with you. Is, is your force going to be using uh, that device? And what, what about the patchwork of forces across the country who don't seem to have the confidence in it that some others have it? Yeah, no, that's a very interesting question. So the Draeger 5000 is the first of a number of instruments that we expect will be approved by the federal government. Uh, we, you know, it is an individual choice for each police service and everybody has to look at their own community and their own situation and what works for them. Um, I am happy that the government has started to approve devices, but I'm looking forward to additional ones coming down the pipe. Because Are you using it in Vancouver? No, looking at it strictly from the VPD perspective, we won't be using it in Vancouver. We've had our traffic experts take a look at it, and we've identified several issues that cause us some concern. So we won't be using that, but we will be using other methods that we've uh, you know, used in the past that are tried and true, like SFST and the drug recognition experts. So all right, all right. we're going to pass on this one and wait for the next device to come on. Chief Gallen in, in, in New Brunswick, uh, not being used at all in New Brunswick, what's the problem there? Yeah, I would echo uh, what Chief Palmer said. Uh, we're, we're hopeful that uh, the technology will uh, will advance and we'll see uh, see more devices in the future. For now, all police forces in New Brunswick have decided not to go with the uh, the only approved device in Canada right now. Uh, as Chief Palmer said, uh, we're also going to rely on our uh, standard field sobriety testing officers and our drug recognition experts. 
uh, which we've done for years and years and years. So, uh, so this is a tried and true method. It's supported by uh, the courts in Canada, and and that's how we are going to continue to do our job. That does raise some questions of concern, though, doesn't it, Chief Palmer? Bill, Bill Blair is saying, look, uh, effectively and essentially saying, look, the device works. It's been around. It's been tested. It's been. He sees no. Re he sees no reason why police forces shouldn't be using the device. So, what is the issue? And should Canadians be concerned that? In you know, if, if the police don't trust the device, uh, what, what's the value of the device for police forces who are using it? Well, you know, everybody has to make their own personal choice, and nobody's saying that the device doesn't work, but I think that you have to look at the totality of the circumstances for your individual police service. So, you know, for us in Vancouver, we've looked at the size of the device, we've looked at the temperature constraints, which, you know, quite frankly, probably aren't as much of an issue in Vancouver as compared to some other climates in Canada, but it still is a concern during certain times of the year. Um, the amount of time it takes to take a sample from a subject at roadside is concerning and the amount of time it takes for analysis. So these are all things that we have to consider and we do have a lot of confidence in the government that there will be other devices with, uh, you know, probably more advanced technology coming along soon and we're going to wait for that. In the meantime, use the methods that we know that work. Chief Gallant, uh, do you believe the federal government's approach to legalization, because this is one of the stated objectives, is to shut down the black market? Uh, the black market, we find out, is already dropping its prices to be more competitive against the legal market. Uh, is this going to shut down the black market? Because that's what the government says and government wants. Well, the black market's going to persist. I mean, let's face it, it's a $7 billion a year industry, the illicit uh, drug industry involving cannabis in this country. So uh, as with any other police operation, even if you look at it from that perspective, uh, when we target organized crime, we may take a particular organized crime group uh, uh, down at any one particular time, but eventually somebody comes along and fills the void. So you can expect that organized crime will be looking for avenues to uh, continue to draw benefit from uh, from cannabis in this country. And, and I expect that uh, you know, there's no end to their creativity in that regard. So the police are going to have to uh, continue to be diligent and be active on cannabis files throughout the country. Yeah, uh, Chief, uh, Chief Palmer, what's your view? Uh, I think those are very astute comments by uh, my colleague, and I agree with him. You know, with the organized crime, it's a fascinating prospect because it is a huge you know, multi-billion dollar industry per year in Canada. We're hoping and we will remain hopeful that the new legislation will uh, take a bite out of the organized crime aspect of it. But we know that they are pretty resilient and crafty and they will try and find ways to work around that and still have a footprint in the cannabis market. Price point is going to be key and you touched on that and if we you know are selling this product in stores and the price is not priced properly and people try and raise it up too much to make profit then it really opens the door for organized crime to come in and undercut so that will be one of the things that will be key. What about uh, what about people who choose to grow their own plants? Uh, there's a, a restriction of four plants per per dwelling. Uh, uh, Chief Gallon, how enforceable is that? Well, I think there's some inherent difficulties with that, but uh, we were happy to, to see at least that there was some restriction placed upon it. Um, there was some worry in the beginning that there would be no restrictions at all, uh, so at least there is that restriction. Uh, but the enforceability of that in a practical sense in, you know, in, in, in various settings, whether they be apartment building settings or rural settings, whatever the case may be, uh, are going to have some inherent difficulties, but, uh, but we're... we're where you have plans to try to address those, and uh, and I'm sure the jurisprudence over time will also develop, uh, and the landscape will change in the coming uh, months and years as as uh, court cases make their way through the courts. Okay, let me finish on this and start with you, uh, Chief Palmer in Vancouver, and and that's, you know, people will want to have as these rules change, people will want to have confidence that the roads are safe. We've we've touched on that. They'll also want to have confidence in in the men and women who who are serving them uh, mm -hmm. as. Uh, because now, uh, with you know cannabis legalized, presumably that that uh, you know applies to uh, members of police forces across the country. But as we're hearing, it applies a whole lot differently depending on where you are. What, what are the rules going to be for the men and women of the Vancouver Police Department in terms of consumption of what is now going to be a legal substance and doing their job? Right. So the landscape is different across the country, and again, you know, similar to when we were talking about approved uh, devices. Uh, HR policies are very specific to your agency and your own set of circumstances. So in Vancouver, we've taken an approach similar to what we've used with alcohol in the past and it will be called a fit for duty policy. So the expectation is that officers will show up for work fit for duty and they'll remain so during the course of their duties. And I have all the confidence in the world in my police officers. You know, the issue of officers showing up to work intoxicated or not fit for duty is just not something that we see in Vancouver. In fact, the last time we had an officer show up like that 
was almost nine years ago. It was at the beginning of the 2010 Olympics. So this is a very rare occurrence, and I'm not anticipating uh, huge issues with that in my agency. What's the rule going to be for your force in the Canada cases, Chief Gallant? Well, I think Chief Palmer covered it very well. Uh, we're seeing in New Brunswick a varied landscape as well. Uh, some uh, police forces are going with the fit for duty definition. Some are going with variants of that associated with the time. Uh, so for us here in Kennebec cases, uh, we're going with a bit of a combination of time and fit for duty uh, parameters as well. So, um, and I think over time, uh, the landscape will probably merge towards uh, more consistency across policing across Canada. Right. So what, what, what's your solution there in Kennebec cases? We've gone with the 28-day uh, prohibition uh, for use of marijuana, but there's also a fit-for-duty definition associated to, uh, um, to it as well. But, but isn't that effectively a ban? If you can't consume marijuana 28 days before a shift, isn't that effectively a ban? Yeah, so I think it is probably, uh, but uh, you know we're working with our. Uh, there's also union negotiations that have to take place as well. The unions will have have a say in this over time. But I think what you're seeing, including myself here, is erring on the side of caution. Um, there's high liability issues involved in policing, as we all know. Uh, so until we see better research on the effects of THC in the human body and when they actually uh, leave the human body, and and uh, uh, I think it's it's uh, a lot of uh, police chiefs like myself are erring on the side of caution at the early stages. Okay, but that, that. that's clearly a different view than Chief Palmer's. Uh, Chief Palmer, you're saying show up fit for duty. I think that's the same as the, the police force here in, in where I am, in the, in the city of Ottawa. Uh, how, how, can there, how can both be okay? Either 28 days is how much you need time between consumption and showing up for work, or fit for duty, which could be what? What does that mean? Two or three days prior to Chief Palmer? What is it? Well, you know, the issue of fit for duty, I think, has left up to the, um, the discretion and the good judgment of officers. And I think our officers realize that, you know, they have a responsibility not only to the general public to make sure that they're showing up fit for work and performing their duties professionally, but also to their fellow officers. And we do work in a dangerous business and we rely on one another in life or death situations. And, you know, the officers in my department are well aware of that. And they know they have to be fit, sober, ready to go when they show up at work to look after their brother officers and sisters and uh, the public. And we don't have any issues with that, so I'm, I'm you know, sure we're just going to be consistent with the way we've always been doing it, and it won't be an issue here. All right. So lots to watch for as the landscape changes in this country and on a number of different fronts for police forces across Canada. Gentlemen, thank you both for your time. I do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.